It's time to hear it from Harlan. Utah Director of Athletics Mark Harlan takes you behind the scenes with the Utes, the Pac-12, and Collegiate Athletics. Now here's your host, Mike Lagasholt. And welcome to Hear from Harlan, presented by Pepsi, our season debut show for the fall of 2020 coming up. Mark will give us an update on all the department developments with COVID-19 and the Pac-12 discontinuing competition this fall. Also, some good news last week from the Pac-12 as they announced the implementation of rapid testing. We'll talk about that and how it can get the youth back to a semblance of normalcy. And also, Mark will share his thoughts on some student-athlete-driven initiatives and also give us an update on the name, image, and likeness legislation that's uh, been bantered about. So, Mark... Welcome to the show. You know, normally you and I are in the Wilson Conference Room in the Burbage Center, and this is the second time we've done this remotely. How you doing? Mike, I'm doing great. Always great to to talk to you and, and have a chance to update all our great fans on, on what's going on. But uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Good to be with you in any format, as always, Mark. Well, I tell you what, the last time you and I did this in the spring, at that point we thought there was a decent chance for fall sports and and to get back to a little bit of a normal life. But here we are. It's early September, and we've had a lot of hypotheticals and, and plan A, plan B, plan C, just, just a lot of motion this summer and early fall. Can you describe a little bit what this has been like, this experience for you and the senior cabinet? I, I can't imagine what you guys have been through the past four or five months. Well, you know, like everybody, uh, we've learned to be to be flexible. We've learned to take the best information that we have and and make decisions. But at the same time, uh, go back back to that flexibility piece and and being able to maneuver. You know, the, the one thing that has been true throughout all of this, you know, the north star for this department has been the health and safety of our students and our coaches and staff. And, you know, the decisions that uh, we've made, whether it be how they came back in the summer to begin voluntary workouts, how we've conducted those, how we've set our testing protocols, you know, all the way down to, to obviously getting toward that, that practice period, that contact practice where we all know now we, we, we took a pause to delay our fall sports uh, to, to today with, with now week three of, of classes and how we're going to keep everyone safe. Uh, with their interactions with the academic staff and everybody else, but we've kept that in mind. And I think once you once you do that and you have that north star, you're able to make good decisions uh, for the well being of everybody. But proud of our students and the way they've handled this. Proud of our coaches and staff. It's been qu- quite a journey. Uh, we're hoping we're on the you know on the far side of the journey rather than the beginning of it. Right. But, uh, I think overall, Mike, we're doing really really well. You know, so much work has gone into the simple things. I'm talking about just having off-season workouts. The athletes came back in waves starting on June 15th, from what I've heard, in terms of testing and the way they've gone. It, it's been very successful. But, you know, just to figure out where can people work out, we have to have social distancing in place. So much planning went into, as I said, just the simple things of summer workouts. But the good news is I've heard they've gone pretty well. If you can, Mark, just talk about, you know, what you and the staff have done to try to help the athletes you know, just get back on campus and be with us during the summer and early fall? Well, we approached it in a, in a crawl, walk, and run format. We, we, if you go back to the summer, we, we focused on our fall sports and those teams that really needed to, to get back, uh, if they so choose, during the voluntary period. Kyle Brennan and Trevor Jamison and Gavin Gow, you know, just put together a committee that really involved our training staff, our strength and conditioning staff, to, to really, you know, put forward the, the best possible way for these young people to come in, get themselves physically ready for whatever was going to come next. But again, by keeping them safe, we followed all the guidelines, not only by the university, but the county. And if you fast forward through that process to where we are today, it, it's amazing to think now we've got approximately 540 plus student athletes now with all our sports back that are in some form or fashion of being back in the facilities, you know, albeit in a way different manner because we're still doing social distance practicing, keeping, you know, any kind of high risk contact out of the equation. And, you know, as I talk to our students and as I talk to our coaches, they're grateful for the opportunity. You know, they all want to do more, but for what they have and what they're able to do, they're, they're really doing a great job. And it just goes back to the planning of, of those folks I mentioned earlier and, and the way they've provided such a platform for our kids to come back safe and work out. We're blessed. We know that there's about six teams in our conference that really aren't able to do what we're doing. So we're, we're blessed at the opportunity. And we know that it will really put us in a good place as these kids work out and, and 
work on their academics to really be able to emerge in the strongest way, which has also been another very important goal. We want to come out of this, you know, the very best versions of ourselves. And that's, uh, that's what we're working on. Well, I've had a chance to talk to some student athletes from my Eats Insider podcast and some coaches as well on various things. I know they appreciate the efforts being made to, to get us back to a little bit of normalcy. Mark, the tough part of all this is uh, financially, you can't get around it when there's, there's no fall sports, no football. You lost approximately $50 million of your $90 million plus operating budget. That's, that's caused some hard decisions to be made with staffing and just how you operate things. If you can, give us the latest on, on kind of how you've uh, you know, watched this play out, some decisions made in terms of how the department functions at this point on September 10th. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's been uh, it's been a really a difficult piece of all of this to to know that the that the league uh, collectively made the decision to delay fall sports. And you know, when you got football in that grouping, you know that that's going to be a significant revenue hit. Um, and so we, you know, we were planning through the summer for this possible outcome. And so, you know, we had different uh, you know different ways that we were going to do it, and we were able to. You know, once the decision was made, I should say by the conference, we were able to to kind of implement those plans. And one of the one of the things that we really lean on here, we talk about one team, not twenty teams here, and one team not only being our our students and our coaches, but our staff and administration is. You know, we wanted to try to do this in that approach, one team. And if we collectively could, for example, all take furloughs at various times you know, from, from really last week when we began the furlough program all the way through the first of the year that we we could gather the the needed, you know, savings uh, rather than, uh, you know, kind of various subsets of the organization. So we, we set up a plan where depending on the position, you either furlough for one week all the way up to, to eight weeks and the positions that are less uh, impacted by this furlough are certainly our, our, you know, people and staff that are involved with being around our students. And that particularly starts with our student development area, our academic staff, because we're in the heart of the semester now, uh, you know, and, and, and that group we need here, you know, the most, certainly others like our event management and our marketing, they maybe took more of the brunt because obviously we don't have events, uh, you know, in, in the foreseeable future. Uh, so we just collectively did that. And it's just appreciative so much of the staff you know, our head coaches, our cabinet, myself, you know, everybody just decided that this was the best way to do it. So if you take that along with our operational cuts that we had implemented prior to the start of the fiscal year in July 1, we were able to, you know, really bring our operating budget down, which now, you know, puts us in a position to work with the university to attain a loan that will help uh, get us through the year. We're so fortunate here. We go into this with, with, with very little debt. Um, great decisions here by my predecessor through the years. When you built something, you made sure you had the money to pay for it. Quite a concept, right? Right. <laughs> and so we go into this in a fiscally sound way. And so we, we know that we're going to uh, accumulate some debt. You know, we'll stretch it out over X amount of years to be determined. But nothing that we can't handle because of the collective efforts by the whole department and the ability to work with the university. So I'm, I'm pleased that we've got a plan to, to maneuver through this. We don't want our students to be affected by this, both on and off the field. That's been a, a tenant through all of this. And, uh, you know, we're just now going to be able to move forward uh, in this in this way. Yeah, it's been a tough, tough time, whether it's athletics, whether it's on main campus, whether you're in the corporate world. A lot of tough decisions being made just because the, the environment has changed and resources and the level of those resources have changed because of this COVID-19 pandemic Visiting with Utah AD, Mark Carlin on the Hear from Harlem podcast presented by Pepsi. Well, Mark, I want to transition to some good news. We had a campaign that was launched a few weeks back called Reinvest in You, where we gave football season ticket holes a chance to either move their ticket payment towards 2021 for the fall. They could uh, designate a portion of that to a tax-deductible donation or request a refund. And the numbers uh, have come back. Uh, some good news. I want to let you share that and, and tell us the latest on how that campaign progressed. Well, I'm so appreciative of, of our incredible fans that uh, really took a look at the various options and many of them, you know, chose to reinvest in different formats, you know, whether that be like you say, on, from a philanthropic point of view, 
or even rolling forward to the 21 season in, in, in the case of our football season ticket holders. And, you know, that's a very significant thing to do too, because we know they'll be back. We know that they'll be with us when we're playing uh, in the 21 season. And that's helpful for us to, to, to have our fiscal planning too. So we're very, very pleased. I know that we're continuing to, to, to talk to folks, um, you know, in that regard. So I wouldn't say we're completely done, but we're very, very happy uh, with, with where we're at. And I think it just is another statement toward, again, toward this incredible fan base who understands that we're going through kind of a challenging time. We, we need assistance more than ever, but at the same time, how appreciative we are because we know many of them are going through such challenging times. So it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. I was very proud of the external team and the efforts that they put together uh, to roll all that out. And, you know, a neat part of this is our student athletes are seeing this too. And, you know, they appreciate um, you know, what our folks are doing. And, uh, so it's, it's a, it's a family in so many different ways, and it's going to allow us to emerge from this, uh, and, and like I said, in the best possible way. Well, Mark, uh, as you mentioned, the athletes were back over the course of summer. Some had a break once the PAT 12 announced that, Hey, we're not going to have sports competition until January one, but school is in session for them, whether it's in person or online, it sounds like fall is, is progressing as well as it can with everything uh, you know being what it is. But some great news last week, Mark, from the Pac-12. They announced on September 3rd that they've partnered with Waddell Corporation, uh, a, a Southern California-based company, for a daily rapid testing program for COVID-19. They will have this take place on every campus. And this has been described, Mark, as a breakthrough, a game changer. And really what it is, is it allows you – as a campus to test day of competition, day of practice, and get results back almost instantaneously to really gauge where your athletes are. This is a huge breakthrough. Tell us about how this came about and your thoughts on, on this breakthrough. Well, Mike, if you go back to you know a month ago now, almost to the day that we taped this, where the medical advisory board had come come you know with their judgments and, and their thoughts about moving forward which at that time was into contact practicing to be able to get ready for a fall sports season you know it was clear that their biggest concern was the testing and the ability to 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 acquire this type of rapid testing in our 12 communities we know that many of, of the counties that our institutions in are, are having you know positivity rates that were high um, and it just didn't seem like there was a real opportunity for us, uh, you know, to, to put our kids out there without that type of testing. And there was other concerns too, that, that were noted. This is a game changer because if you look at the fact that now we have a company who will supply the 12 institutions, you know, that 15 minute test where you can imagine you get tested in the morning in our high contact sports of which football would be one. We can know if, if, if that, if that young person or that staff member, where they stand with the virus and we get it in practice and, and, and then as such play. And then we know we're competing with, with teams in the same way. So as such, now sport is not contributing to, to the virus for that young person and it's not contributing to, to the, the community spread. And so, you know, I do believe that this is the path to get us started again. Our commissioner said that publicly and I believe that to be the case. We still have a lot of work to do. We need to understand more about how we're going to do the tests. You know, we know we're going to get a, a couple different devices to be able to do that. We're going through training process now with our with our group here, along with the other institutions. And then we'll see where we're at, and we'll talk to our presidents and CEOs and see where they're at, and collectively uh, make some decisions. Obviously, with the buck stopping with our presidents and chancellors to see if we can't go ahead and, and begin contact practice is our first step in those sports. And then of course, once you do that, that leads to games. So, you know, it, it's, it's a great development. I give commissioner Scott so much credit for, for making this happen. I think it's great for our students. We have an obligation to keep them safe and this is a very big deal. You know, I have gotten some questions, Mike, about, well, okay, I understand that. Now, where does that leave the questions about some of the heart effects and the lung effects? You know, as described to me by by the doctors, you know, obviously they're still learning more about this virus. We do pre-COVID, we've done we do massive screenings of our kids uh, in this space. I think what I'm hearing from our doctors is is once you test every day and you know clean is playing clean, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, the concerns about the heart effect now are not there. You know, what we do know is that any kid that has tested positive in our protocol so far since we've come back and we've been lucky, it's been limited. But we know that we're putting those kids through quite extensive cardiac testing, and, and that will continue. So, like I said, I think this is the opening that we, we were all hoping for. You know, now it's our obligation as, as, as a league to, to uh, 
you know, to implement this and then make decisions uh, going forward. But it is a very significant development. Um, we got, I like I said, we got more work to do, but I think it's the path to get us there. Yeah, certainly some great news after kind of a long spring and summer of just sort of the the unknowns, especially with long term health effects, as you mentioned. So, Mark, the next question that the fans tend to have is, okay, you know, the Pac-12 announced nothing in terms of competition until January 1. But now that we have this rapid testing program, we know the NCAA is going to announce September 16th about the delay of the the basketball season. And as of right now, the Pac-12 has has said nothing until January 1. But with the NCAA announcement of probably going to, you know, probably pushing back the basketball season start with this testing program, can the Pac-12 maybe nudge that date towards December to start competition at some point? Well, I think, you know, kind of like what I said earlier, I think it's just a matter of us getting this testing, uh, new testing protocol in place once we, once we have all the products and making sure it's, it's uh, functioning like, like we believe it will. And then our presidents and, and chancellors taking a look uh, with where we're at and listening to the medical advisory board and certainly the athletic directors and other staffers that are involved in that. And if they want to, to look at that and, and decide that they want to reapproach or rethink uh, the January one marker that's kind of out there, then I imagine that they will take a, take a look at all the evidence and data like they've been doing on their various campuses uh, throughout this process. So, you know, as we stand right now, we are on the January one delay. Things could change based on this testing news. You mentioned that next week, uh, in terms of men's and women's basketball, we're going to find out if the NCAA is moving the date back. Uh, you know, we anticipate that they will uh, move that back to possibly Thanksgiving weekend. We'll wait and see. And if our testing and, and our and our medical advisors take a hard look at this, then leadership of the 12 schools will also take a look. And if it makes sense for the health and safety of the kids. Uh, to get back on the courts and fields, then uh, I'm sure they'll they'll take that rather seriously. Um, so it's just nice to be to be talking about positive develops in the, development in this. And you know, my 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 hope is that we can. But at the same time, I want to make sure that our that our students know that we still have work to do. Uh, you know, getting their hopes up is 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 good in terms of excitement. But you also want to make sure that we manage everyone's expectations. But I think it's a great. Uh, a great development, and we'll see where it leads. Yeah, certainly some positive news, uh, which we all needed. Uh, the other question, Mark, uh, has come about spring football from fans. You know, obviously nothing this fall as it stands right now, but the NCAA Football Oversight Committee announced last week they recommend eight games over 13 weeks in the spring is sort of what they're looking at. That would not include a conference championship game. You know, Mark, uh, what are you hearing on the possibility of spring football for the Pac-12 conference and a time frame and what we need to also get that going. What have you heard on that? Well, the league's been spending a lot of time on this matter. You know, our, our, our league's established a football working group back in March. Kyle Brennan, myself, and Jeff Rudy are all on that committee representing uh, the University of Utah. And that group has <laughs> had a lot of output, you know, yeah. throughout this whole process. And, and we are busy working on what that l- could look like. Obviously, we all got to jump in our step with this testing, which... I think told all of us that that the the ability to play uh, the first of the year uh, seemed like a real real realistic possibility, and so a lot of times being spent on it. I think the number one thing that I think of when we start talking about this this winter spring football model is we have to protect the fall of twenty one. Fall of twenty one is very important to get back into a a regular rhythm for for all the reasons that you can imagine. So. As we look at that, you know, the football oversight committee certainly set kind of a, an eight game max regular season. I think within the league, we just have to, to really take a hard look. Is that the right number for us? Is it, is it less than that? Would it make sense, for example, to play, you know, all your division uh, opponents and then perhaps that champion, uh, you know, play the, uh, you know, the other division and, and then have a league champion? You know, or do you perhaps play six, maybe one crossover game? I mean, we're looking at all of that. I think the ability for us to, to kind of have equal home games is being looked at. But I think the real point uh, in all of this is it just feels real. It feels, it feels like this is a, this is a true possibility. You know, again, we're under the January one, um, kind of, uh, edict right now. If, if things change, we could possibly start earlier. Um, but I think that wherever you start, you know, whether it's a little after the first of the year or perhaps, you know, prior to, you know, you can fit in some games and, and still have a lot of rest 
before the 21 season. But our medical advisory board has really started to look at that from the, from the league perspective. There's not a lot of prior years to, to study on this. <laughs> no, this no. New, but we know that the, that the kids have to, to, to have recovery time. Um, and that's going to be vitally important. Uh, you know, so our head coaches are, are involved in the planning, our athletic directors, uh, we're certainly trying to get some frameworks and we want to have the, the students take a good hard look at that. I will tell you that our students here at the University of Utah have been instrumental. Our football leadership group that, that Coach Witt has has been instrumental in really, you know, planting some really important uh, seeds in my mind about what's important to them. You know, it has to be a meaningful season, right? Right. It has to, it has to be something at the end of it. Uh, you know, they, they were very concerned, for example, that if they were to, to participate in something like this, would it affect their eligibility? Well, we know three weeks ago that was settled by the NCAA. It's a freebie year. They can get out there and play and it won't cost them a year. So, you know, there's, there's excitement uh, in the Echoes Football Center about this possibility. We're working on it. We look forward to uh, getting some resolutions of what it could be. But, but again, I, I am a, uh, a really strong believer now that we are going to play football this academic year. We don't know the date, but we are going to play meaningful football games this year and, and excited to, to see uh, where it all ends up. Yeah, some some great news on that front as well. You know, Mark, I talked to Yogi Roth on my Youth Insider podcast about three weeks ago, and he said, you know, if the, if the Pac-12 and Big Ten can work in concert and have a Rose Bowl uh, at the end of all this and, and play your six to eight games, and he says, hey, you know, as a media partner, we'll find a way to put the games on, whether it's live, uh, whether it's live streaming. There's a way to make all this happen, and, and the positive, Mark, could be, you know, if we have a vaccine by spring, there might be a chance to get more fans in the stands than we could have had this fall. So you talk about an eight-game schedule for home games. There's a lot of things that could be good about spring football in 21. Well, it's certainly different. I mean, there's no doubt that it, you, you kind of sit there and go, boy, this this will feel different. This will look different. And, and I understand that. But I think there's so many positives to it, too. Again, we have to protect the 21 season, and then we have to have a meaningful season. You know, I know the media partners are are intrigued by it. I mean, they they are absolutely always looking for content. You know, the NBA will will decide when they're going to come back and all the other things that go on in the spring. But, you know, we were talking over here recently about where this thing feels today with this thing development is that we we really could have quite quite a, a, an active winter spring here, right? <laughs> with, with with one could imagine, you know, all our sports kind of going on at the same time because. Remember, volleyball and, and women's soccer will be moving to to the spring, too. So where we've had kind of a, a lot of quiet lately in terms of competition, uh, we could see that completely uh, go 180 uh, here later. But, boy, how exciting that is to think about from a student's point of view who spent their whole life getting ready to compete and, and then certainly uh, from a fan point of view. So, you know, pay attention. Uh, you know, is what I tell everybody, stay positive. I think the Utes are going to be out there full speed ahead um, before too long. Yeah, it could be a fun spring where you have a home football weekend, you have baseball and softball and action, maybe volleyball and, and soccer, and you basically bring your, your RV up to campus on Thursday night. You camp out for the weekend, and it could be a lot of fun. So uh, certainly some positive news on, on the sports front as we uh, work our way through September. Uh, you know, Mark, I wanted to get into a couple off the field topics before we wrap things up. It's been a while since you and I have talked and it's been just a, a crazy spring and summer, with just so many things going on away from competition and social unrest. I want to talk to you about the Utah group that it's comprised of student athletes. I know you've talked to them about various things and they've made some efforts with voter registration. Uh, they've got some thoughts on racial equality, social justice. I saw a survey this past week that said something like 60% of college student athletes want to be involved and have a voice in these issues. It used to be that, you know, especially college athletes just kind of stayed away from these things. This group, this generation Z has, has changed that a little bit. And I know you've been involved with the Utah group. Uh, maybe just tell us about some things you've talked to them about and, and, and your thoughts on what they're doing over the past few months. Well, our students uh, here at the University of Utah are, are remarkable in so many different ways. You know, we saw what they did academically last spring with that 3.5 plus GPA. Our graduation rates in the mid 90s, right up there with Stanford. And to me, this is just another step in in what they've been able to accomplish. And and that's using their voice and you know knowing that they have a platform um, in in Salt Lake and and particularly here, but also out from wherever they've come from, because, you know, they've gotten to this stage athletically and, 
academically, uh, you know, to, to, to be on that platform. And they have been dramatically affected by the events of this summer, as we all have. They have been remarkable in, um, you know, using their voice to, to remind people that we have a lot of inequity in our society and they're collectively working together to, to affect change. The Utah group, uh, which was led by our student development uh, staff, this group was established prior to the murder of George Floyd. It certainly has had a greater impact uh, since that tragedy and, and throughout the summer. Um, and, you know, this group has really focused their efforts now on voter registration and, and getting our students to, to their fellow students, I should say, to participate uh, in, in, in that process. And, and, you know, I would say being on a college campus for as many years as I have, and, and so many students that are coming from other communities, you know, they just don't vote because they're not in their region, but you know, the way things are set up now, they, they can register to vote, whether they're here or they can get online and register to vote in California and Texas. And so our, our teams have been heavily involved in that. And it's been great to see, you know, I, I think that we know within the industry the voices that that have always come to us in administration have been so vital in decisions that we've made. And now, of course, it's it's going beyond and, and, and into this world. So very proud of them. Um, it hasn't been easy for them. I mean, we've had conversations at times where they've, they've been disappointed with some of the reactions on their social media. Um, and we just work through it and we talk about it. And, you know, and, and that's part of the, the developing of, of them as young people and, and, and learning um, and I'm just really proud of our coaches too, and, and how they've been so open to conversations. And, you know, I've learned so much. I mean, I, I've learned so much from them and, and things that I never realized and things that I wasn't aware of. And, you know, so our students are doing a fabulous job in, in that space. And, um, it's, it's good to know we have the, the platform here for them to, to utilize. It's good to know that we have great mentors around them. Um, and it's fun to watch them grow and, and be such incredible leaders in this space. Yeah, they've done some great things. The Utah Group, it stands for United Together Against Hate. It's formed of Utah student-athletes, and they have certainly had a voice on various topics throughout the spring and summer months and a voice that deserves to be heard. Mark, another topic off the field you and I have talked about already uh, last spring, in fact, was the progress of name, image, and likeness legislation. In fact, in July, the NCAA presented Congress its version of a proposal for that, then the policy will be voted on in January. We expect it to be passed, and it will go into effect for the 21-22 academic year. And, Mark, this allows athletes essentially to make money and be compensated for use of their name, image, and likeness. As you sit in your chair as the Utah AD watching this progress, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so we expect in January the, the rules will, will be different, and, and students uh, that compete will have the ability to monetize uh, you know, in the name, image, and likeness space. That can be anything from, you know, being involved with companies on in a social media format or the more traditional media that we see. Uh, it could also be involved in skill instruction. It could be involved in, in, a, in quite a many different things. And the NCAA is finalizing their legislation. Uh, that's going through its final process now. We anticipate that uh, being in effect sometime early uh, in 2021. At the same time, we know a lot of state laws have been developed. Uh, and the federal laws also are, are, you know, looking to come out. What we're doing here at Utah is just we're monitoring, uh, the, the obviously the landscape. Uh, we, we want to be the best in everything we do. We want to make sure our students have the opportunity uh, to monetize, uh, in that regard. We're working on brand development, how to appropriately look at your brand, so to speak, and, and to be able to, to maximize that. Um, that's important for us to do that. We, we know that. Our expectations for our students won't change. We, you know, we, we expect their grades to, to be as good as they always are and obviously being a teammates and all those kind of things. But I think this is going to wind up being a great development. There's still a lot of, uh, you know, things we need to understand with it. Uh, I update our student body, our group, I should say, here in our Crimson Council leadership group about it. But certainly will be a milestone change for intercollegiate athletics. And I suspect that here at Utah, we'll, we'll handle it really well and our kids will have an opportunity we know that uh, in, a, in a town that's all about the Utes, we do think some of our kids will have great opportunities, and we want to make sure that they, they have the ability to do so. All right, visiting with Utah AD Mark Harlan on the Here from Harlan podcast for the month of September. Well, Mark, no collegiate competition going on right now, but a couple of Utes were in action last weekend at the Utah State Amateur Golf Championship in Jeremy Ranch. It came down to those two Utes, Mitchell Shaw 
top Blake Tomlinson three and two to win the state title. So congratulations to both for making the final two and to Mitchell for winning the championship. Also, the NFL getting started this weekend, Mark, and 21 former youths are on active rosters for NFL teams. Six more making practice squads. That's 27 former youths involved with the NFL this fall. Yeah, it's been great to 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 watch those kids trace their dreams, and particularly as it relates to the NFL piece. You know, so many of those those uh, kids that are competing, I've got a chance to know because you know a lot of them are last last few years, but certainly the ones that have been in the league for so many years to have another opportunity. It's a blessing, uh, and you know it's just them continuing to trace their dreams. Our golfers, you know, Ute versus Ute, right? You're, right. You're cheering in every every shot, <laughs> and that's great. But you know, I will say this: all of that is incredible, and and we know our our students come in here and, and they dream about, you know, in the case of football guys uh, playing. We we certainly saw NBA guys in the bubble. Kuz comes to mind, and others. Yeah. So the one thing that really struck me throughout this whole a pandemic situation is we had a program here where we sent care packages off to former student athletes who graduated from here that are involved in the medical field, nurses, doctors, uh, you know, you name it. And I, I, I wrote letters and then the staff put together, um, you know, care packages. And I was just amazed how many of our former student athletes are in the medical field and have just been performing heroically throughout this, throughout this period. And, Although I do, I celebrate our NFL and I celebrate all of that. You know, I, I do want to really give a tip of the hat to, to, to so many of our former student athletes who have been on the front lines during this crisis and in performing incredibly well. And so I really think about them too. And, and of course, a lot of our supporters uh, who are also in that space. So very grateful uh, for all of them and doing what they're thing, doing their thing and, and providing such amazing, great work for society. But always proud of our former student athletes who go out and do great stuff. Great thoughts there, Mark, about our former athletes working in the medical profession. I was amazed at how many are in that field. But you think about it, Utah's had a great medical school for a long time. Kids come here because of that. And to see so many of our former youths move on and, and be on the front lines, it was amazing. Also, guys like Isaac Asiata, former football player who played in the NFL, now works for the Provo Police Force. He's been out there getting it done every day. So just so fun to see uh, some of our people doing so well in, in challenging times. And I know you've dealt with some challenging times as well, Mark, from your chair as the AD. It's, it's been uh, a period of tough decisions. and But you know what? Some good news, as we said, with the rapid testing program coming online here soon and uh, some positive news perhaps coming uh, in terms of competition getting going here soon, a plan for that. I think we're hopefully seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, Mark. So as always, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you as well and all your work. And just again, want to thank all our great supporters for sticking with us during this this time. And we look forward to seeing everybody hopefully really soon. All right. That will do it for the September edition of the Hear From Marlin podcast presented by Pepsi. Thanks to Mike Gilliland on the technical side. I'm Mike Ligashoth. Until next time. So long, everybody. This has been the Hear It From Harlan podcast. Subscribe and listen all year long as we keep you up to date on Utah Athletics.